And if you don't have a strong relationship with Jesus, if you don't know him, if you don't trust him in small crises, how are you going to trust him in the biggest crisis? Can you hear me in the back, everybody? Wonderful. Praise the Lord. I, uh, I want to thank those who have organized the event, the leaders. I want to thank the conference, the union, the division for their hospitality to allow me to come on their territory. And I want to express my joy and my privilege to be with the precious people here. People of God, the family. We are all a family, aren't we? We are going to live together in heaven. We are God's people. So before we start, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, in humbleness we come in your presence. And we thank you for your love and we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for the privilege to open your word right now. We pray that it's not going to be me speaking, but only you. That we all may see Jesus and we all may be transformed. So please work with your Holy Spirit that it may all be for your glory. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So, yes, it's a joy for me to be here. Unfortunately, I'm, I have very little time because I am between trips. And, uh, but maybe by God's grace, if God allows it, another time we'll have more time to give. Um, so I have a question for you. How many of you love Jesus? You love Jesus? Uh, yes. You love Jesus? Yes. Wonderful. How do you know that you love him? How, how do you know? Because it's easy to say, oh, how I love Jesus. Anybody can say it. I can say I love Jesus. I can say I love my wife. But I need to prove it. How do you know? How do you measure? What is the measurement for you to honestly know, not that you think that you love Jesus, but actually to love Jesus and God would say, yes, he or she loves me. How do you know? Let me give you an example. I love Jesus with all my heart, and I love my wife with all my heart. Okay. I don't love anything else. But I have a truck, a Ford F-250. Man, it's my baby. It has speed. It has power. It's big. It's tall. When I'm on the road, all the other cars are here. You know, I can look on their heads. It's fast, it's new, it doesn't have a scratch. I love that. No, I like that truck. I don't love, I love Jesus, but I don't like the truck. Okay. And so, two weeks ago, I was preaching for the Ministerial Association. And we were in a convention center. I was ready to preach. Ready to preach. I got up, had the prayer. When I opened my mouth, exactly when to say, when, when to start speaking, the police comes at the door. Mr. Goya, come out. I said, why? What have I done? They said, no, 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 nothing. It's just in an incident. You are involved in an accident. I said, how could I be involved in an accident if I am here? They said, no, not you, your car. I said, my car doesn't drive alone. My car is parked in the parking. In front of the convention center, there is parking with white lines, parking spots and my car is properly parked in fact I, I like my truck so much that i never park my truck among cars because somebody may open the door and scratch my car so i park far away and then i walk so nobody touches my car i like my car it's spotless doesn't have a scratch so the police takes me all the way to my truck. An old man got out of the hotel, out of the parking, and he didn't stop at the stop sign. He hit a car that was going 60 miles per hour, that's 100 kilometers per hour, going on the highway. He hit that car in the back. That car went spinning, hit the curb, flew over the sidewalk, and hit my car. What are the odds 
A car hits a car who hits my car. But not one hour before I speak, not one hour after I speak, exactly in the second when I open my mouth to speak. That's Satan. He wanted to distract me. He wanted to stop me from preaching. And so I'm looking to my car, the back bent, the wheel bent. I mean, a small car hit my big truck so hard that moved my truck out of place. A lot of damage is going to be over $23,000 to fix the truck. A lot of damage. And I got stomach pain. Oh, I felt like going to the old man, what's wrong with you? Why don't you stop at the stop? But I just kept calm, but I turned red. Because I love that car. That's my car. And the police says, Mr. Goya, don't worry, calm down. It's going to take two hours. Stay here, we do a report, and then the insurance is going to fix your car. And when they said it's going to take two hours, it came to my mind. People are waiting for me to preach. It's Sabbath morning, 11 o'clock. I told them I will be back in two minutes. Satan is trying to stop me from preaching. He's trying to distract me. So I said to the police, you know what? Do your job. Do the report. I'm going to do my job. I go inside. But, but, but you need to be here. I said, trucks are going to burn in the fire when Jesus comes. I need to do my work. So I left the truck. I went inside and I preached like nothing happened. But let me ask you. Do you think... I love that car. Yes or no? Honestly. Oh, yes. Whatever. You are not willing to give up. That's who you worship. Wherever is your heart, that's where your treasure. Wherever is your treasure, that's where your heart is. They go together. Whatever things you love, that's what you worship. I want you to think about it. We say we love God. The Bible says love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And love your neighbor just as you love yourself. Love God more than anything else. Love God more than anything else. If there is anything in your life that you are not willing to surrender, let me ask you, are you willing to give up your house or your job or your car? or your? Are you willing to give up everything? If I would come to you and say, give up this, are you willing to give up everything? Because if there is something that you have doubts, that you say, ah, should I, if I give up my job, what's going to happen to me? If I give up my house, where I'm going to sleep? If there is anything that you don't give up, that's your God. That's who you worship. Paul says, I consider all things. How many things? How many things? How much means all? How much means all? I did a translation from Greek. You know how you translate the word all? Yes, all. That's how you translate it. All is all. All is not 50%. All is not 90%. All means 100% all. Paul says, I consider all garbage for the price of knowing Jesus Christ my Savior. If there is something that you don't consider garbage, that's who you worship. That's what Satan is using to distract you from God. Anything that stresses you, that's your God. Only your relationship with God should stress you. Let me explain a little. Jesus is walking to Jerusalem. For three years and a half, Jesus keeps telling the disciples, I will die, I will die, I will die. Three years and a half, again and again and again and again and again and again. And they say, Peter says, oh, God forbid. Jesus is walking to Jerusalem in the last week of his life. And he says, the son of man is going to be killed. And you know what they say? 
When Jesus clearly says, we go to Jerusalem and I will die. You know what they say? Jesus, can I be on your left and can I be on your right when you are the king? What's wrong with them when Jesus said, I will die? And they say, can I be the prime minister and the secretary of state? What was wrong with them? Can you go to the church? God is talking to you. And you don't hear what he says. You hear what you want to hear. Because we are so blinded by our mentality and our plans and our ways that we don't hear what God says. We hear what we think he says because we have filters like in politics. Everybody interprets things the way they want, like they are blind. Can you go to church alive and God talks to you like the disciples? I will die. And you say, can I be on your right? Can you be in the church and totally blind and lost? Yes or no? Oh, yes. In the church. The Bible says one is going to be taken and one is going to be left. You remember? From ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. In the church. In the church. You think you are saved, but you are lost. Jesus goes to Jerusalem. And on the way to Jerusalem, he says, I will die. They get to the Mount Olives. Anybody has been there? I've been there. You go on Mountain of Olives. And then you come down. There is a cemetery. And then you come down. At the bottom is the garden called Gethsemane. In that garden, there are many, 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 many olive trees. Some of them, I would say about 22, 23 of them are very old. Over, over 2,000 years old olive trees. It's estimated 2,200 years or more olive trees old. They are very, very, very thick with a hole inside in the middle of the tree. And Jesus prayed under one of those trees. When I went there, I wanted to pray where Jesus prayed. So I didn't know under what tree did Jesus pray. So I prayed under all 23 to make sure that I prayed where Jesus prayed. I know for sure that I prayed exactly where Jesus prayed because I prayed under each tree to make sure. And so Jesus stops, is, you, you go down, is the cemetery, and then, then the Gethsemane garden, and then cross the street, and then there is a hole that is called Gena where they throw the garbage, and then you go up, and then is the, the, the city, Jerusalem. Well, Jesus stops on the Mount of Olives, op opposite from Jerusalem. And it's evening, and the sunset, the, the brightness of the sun hits the city, and the city was made out of marble, the walls, big blocks, around 20 tons weight, each block of marble, big blocks of shining marble, and between the blocks is not mortar, is not mud, is gold. And as the sun hits the marble and the gold, the, the, the brightness shines that it takes your view, is just magnificent. And the disciple showed Jesus, do you see the city? It is beautiful. And Jesus says, I tell you for sure, there will be not one stone over the other one. And the disciples don't get it. Jesus, it's impossible. This is Jerusalem. This is the center of religion. This is the center of the world. Very good location because all the commerce that happened went through that location. All the commerce that would go back and forth between countries would go through that point. And they say, Jesus, this is an excellent location. This is the center of the religion. This is where Shekinah glory, God's glory was here. This is where God's Ark of the Covenant, the law that God himself wrote with his finger. 
and God spoke the law. This is where the law was. This is where God's glory was. This is the center of religion. This is the center of the country. This is one of the ten miracles of the world. How can you tell us that there will not be one stone over the other? And Jesus says, it's going to be totally destroyed. And for them to destroy the temple, that was the end of their nation. And they thought that was the end of the world. And they said, tell us when it's going to happen and what will be the sign of the end. Because they thought that would be the end. And what did Jesus say? Listen carefully. What did Jesus say? Jesus doesn't say, oh, there will be wars, there, there will be earth. No, he doesn't start that way. Jesus says, be careful. Jesus says, Jesus says, take heed so no one deceives you. That's how he starts. Take heed. What does it mean to take heed? What does it mean? How do you translate it? Pay attention. Watch it. Be careful. Jesus starts with these words. Be careful. Careful so no one deceives you. Listen carefully. You don't need to tell me, hey, Pavel, come to it. Because I go to it before you call me. Why would you call me, come on it, if I came? You don't need to wake somebody up if they are already, hey, wake up, if they don't sleep. Why would Jesus say, take heed, if they are paying attention? You call somebody to wake up who is sleeping. You ask somebody to be careful who is not. Jesus says, be careful so no one deceives you. And Jesus gives these signs of the end in three locations. Matthew 24. What is the second one? Luke 21. What is the third one? Mark 13. Repeat with me. Matthew 24 and 25. Luke 21 and Mark 13. And they all start the same. Take heed. Pay attention. Because there will be false Christs. And false prophets. And false doctrines. Are there false doctrines? Yes or no? Oh, yes. Even in the church, you hear people who no longer believe in the sanctuary. People who no longer believe in the Trinity. People who no longer believe in the spirit of prophecy. People who no longer believe in the inspiration of the Bible. They take the Bible and read it the way they like it. The spirit of prophecy says, study as it reads. As, as it is written, that's how you should. Un Don't twist it to match. Don't twist the Bible to match your views. Switch your, your views to the Bible. People who no longer believe in the Sabbath. People who know, you follow me? There are all types of doctrines. Take the Bible as it is. It is God's word. And Jesus says, watch it. Pay attention. And then at the end of the chapter, he says, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. The spirit of prophecy says, listen carefully. Only those, these very words, only those who have fortified the mind through prayer and study of the word will resist in the final crisis. How many of people? How many? Only those that have fortified the mind with what? Prayer and? Huh? Study of the Bible, study of the word. Prayer and study. The Bible says that before Jesus comes, Elijah will come. Elijah will come. What did, do, what did Elijah do? What did he do? When Elijah came, he did something. He fixed the altar. You remember? He fixed the altar. Only those that have fortified the mind, mind with prayer and the study of the word will resist in the final crisis. Every single king that was a good king, a good leader in Israel history, he did something. Every single good king that brought reformation and brought the people back to God, he did two things. What did they do? Took away the idols and fixed the altar. What does it mean to take away all the idols 
and to fix the altar. Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation in the most holy place, we are not going to go through the prophecies now, but what does he mean, abomination? Ellen White says that abomination, it's many things. But the highest, she says, the highest possible abomination that is detestable to God is idolatry. And then she says, it's not necessarily about having a, a gold or a stone idol that you clean and dust and put it and kiss it. But she says, anything that you love more than God, anything that distracts you from your relationship with God is an idol. Listen, is it okay to love your family? Yes or no? Yeah. You should love your family. Why do you say yes? You should love your family. But should you love your family more than God? No. Have you seen parents loving children more than God, spoiling children? Yes? Yes. I even spoil my dog. My dog, Gucci, sleeps on my pillow around my head like a crown. Anything that you love more than God, that's your idol. And then she says, anything that you are not willing to surrender and sacrifice, that's your idol. That's abomination. That's idolatry. You should love God with all your heart, all your mind. All your... I was, we moved to America 27 years ago. We moved to America. When we moved to America, we had nothing. We were poor. To America with $140 in my pocket. $140. We did have stuff in Romania. We did have a lot. But we gave everything away to poor people. We gave our furniture. We gave our car. We gave our washer. We gave our dryer. We gave our TV. We gave even our clothing. We gave everything away to poor people. And we went to America like this. Nothing. $140. And then we worked hard, 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 hard. And finally, when I was in Andrews, I had money to buy a car. My first car in America. And I had $2,500. So I talked to my friend. And he says, you cannot buy a car with $2,500 unless you buy a junk. You need $25,000 to buy a car. I said, well, I have this $2,500. Let's go to auction. We went to auction. And my friend says, let's buy this Toyota. I said, no, it's ugly. I found a van, a Dodge Grand Caravan, that it has TV. Now, to have a TV in the car is not a big deal today. But in 1999, to have a TV in the car was a big deal. And it had video games, and it had lights and sensors in the bumper. It was all luxury. And I said to my friend, you see that van? That Dodge, it has TV and video games and lights and it's fancy and it's luxury. I want that car and it's only 2,500. And my friend says, that should be around 20,000. If it's 2,500, there is something wrong with it. Don't buy it. I said, I like the van. I'm going to buy it. And my friend says, did you pray about it? I said, I don't need to pray. I like it. He says, okay. So I bought the van. I drove to Andrews to the seminary. When I parked in front of the seminary, I left the door open so the classmates would see the TV inside. I was like... <laughs> Nobody looked. Two weeks later, I was driving to school. It had automatic transmission. And the car goes... Uh, 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 It would not switch from second to third gear. Like, uh, 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 you know? It would not switch. It got stuck in the second gear. Uh, uh, and it was going, the engine like, uh, you think it would go 100 miles per hour? And it was going only 10 miles per hour. Really slow. You could even walk by the van. And the other cars were, chung, chung, and me, uh, you think that the engine would explode. I stopped the car, and then 
Start it again. Uh, 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 again. Got stuck in the second gear. I stop the car and I pray, Lord Jesus, please heal my car. Heal my transmission. Start the car. Uh, 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 nothing. I got angry. I got off the car. I hit the wheel. Junk. And my wife says, calm down, you are a pastor. Calm down, you are a pastor. Say, leave me alone. This junk. I prayed. I fasted. Nothing. Because we fasting as a hunger strike to convince God to listen to our voice. Instead of using fasting to clear our mind so we listen to God's voice. Nothing happened. So I went to the cemetery, to the junkyard, and I purchased a second-hand transmission, paid $450 for it, and then I paid a mechanic that was one of my elders, another $500, altogether $950, replaced the transmission, I drove it two, three weeks, and it broke again. It got stuck in the second gear. I hated the car. Why in the world I wanted a car with TV? I paid again another 450. I got again another transmission. I paid another 500 labor to, to install it. I drove the car, it broke again. Oh, it got me gray hair. I hated that car from the bottom of my heart. I went again to the junkyard. I bought another transmission. I paid another 500 labor. I installed it. I said, I'm no longer going to drive the car. I'm going to sell it. Let somebody else have it. I put the car for... I put it in front of the Walmart, in front of the grocery shopping center, in front of the mall. I put it in the market. Nobody called me. I put a paper in the windshield. Luxury car with TV inside. <laughs> Nobody called. I put it on Craigslist. On, I put it on Amazon. I put it on eBay. Nobody called. I asked $5,000 because I wanted to recover the money that I, I spent. To Nobody called. I dropped the price from $5,000 to $4,500. Nobody called. I dropped the price from $4,500 to $4,000. Nobody called. I got tired. I prayed, Lord Jesus, please help me sell the junk. Nobody called. I said, I'm going to drive it until it breaks and I throw it away. I drove to church and I gave a sermon. And I said, you should love God more than anything. And whatever you don't give up, that's what you worship. Whatever you are not willing to surrender. If there is something in your life that you are not willing to surrender, that you are not willing to sacrifice, that's what you love more than God. Because if you love God more, you'd have no problem to sacrifice everything. And then, after I gave the sermon, I got in my van. I said, Lord, please help me sell the car. Please help me sell the car. Please help me sell the car. Please, please, please. And God spoke in my mind. Do you love me? Yes. More than anything. Yes. Give me the car. Come on. You are God. You fly. You don't need a car. <laughs> and God said, give me the car. I said, Jesus, I can give it to you because this is not Mercedes. This is a junk, but you don't need it. If I give you the car, what do I drive? And God said, do you love me more than anything? Yes. And God spoke in my mind. It's easy to say you love me. But prove it. Give me the car. I said, okay, how much do you pay for it? <laughs> because I need money to buy another car. I am a student. I am poor. And God said to me, who takes care of you? Who gives you help? Who gives you a job? Who wakes you up every day? Didn't I promise you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? The other things, I promise, God says, I promise, and God doesn't lie. I promise the other things will be provided. If I take care of the flowers, don't you think that I love you and I will take care of you? Give me the car. If you don't give me the car, God said, you don't love me. So I said, okay, Lord. It was like when you go to the dentist, like pulling teeth. 
I, I, it was really hard to say it. I said, okay, Lord, I have hard time to say it, but you can have the car. I give you the car. As soon as I said, okay, Lord, you can have the car, my telephone started to ring. It was one of my church members. She, she is a nurse. She says, pastor, do you still have that car? I said, what car? The van. I said, yes. I want to buy it. I said, I'm not going to sell it to you because if I sell it to you, you would hate me, never come back to church. I'm going to sell it to a stranger. She says, no, 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 no. I know it's a junk because my brother is the mechanic who installed the transmission. I know it's a junk. But when you preach that you need to love Jesus more than anything and sacrifice everything, I prayed, I said, Lord, I love you and I want to sacrifice something and all I have is $2,000. I don't have anything else. But I love driving. And there are people that don't have a car and they want to come to church. And there are children who don't have a car and they want to come to our school. So I dedicate my time I'm going to drive them to church. I'm going to drive them to evangelism. I'm going to drive them to school. But I don't have a car. All I have is 2000 So, pastor, I don't have money to buy a new car, 25000 But I have 2000 Would you give me your junk for 2000 I said, okay, you can have it. I gave her the car. And then God blessed me. I got another car. I got a Toyota this time. <laughs> Five years later, I moved. Another five years later, I was driving, going in vacation. So I went to that district with my family. And we stopped to eat. And guess who was eating in that restaurant? It was this lady. Ten years later. I said, how are you doing? Good. You pastor, good. I said, so what do you drive? Did it go a week, two weeks? When did it break? And she says, no, I'm still driving the car. I hated the car. Ten years later, she was still driving. She says, it never broke again. I said, what in the world? It broke three times for me. She says, well, I gave it to God. And since I used it for God, it never broke again. It reminded me, the Bible says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever is willing to lose his life will save it. Whatever you give God is blessed, multiplied, preserved. Whatever you keep is cursed. And God says, do you love me? Think about this. Jesus, that is God. Jesus, that has no beginning and no end. Jesus, that is the creator, is the one who said, let there be light, and there was light, is the one who split the sea, is the one that angels cover themselves and they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, is the Lamb of God, Jesus God himself, left the glory of heaven and came here, and God himself took the sin of the entire world, took the sins of every criminal, every, every horrible sin from the history, the beginning of history to the end, the whole world, Every country, every person, every age, every generation. Jesus took the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. He took all sins. And he didn't take only the sin of the world. He took your sin and your sin and my sin. God himself took your own sins. And he died on the cross for you so you don't have to die. So you could have eternal life. And Jesus risked eternity. Because if he was not perfect, his sacrifice would not be accepted. Jesus, God himself, died for you. He loves you so much. If you love him, are you willing to sacrifice everything for him as he did for you? Because if there is something that you are not willing to sacrifice, you worship that thing more than God. Because God gave his own life for you. And you say, oh, how I love Jesus. And you go to church and sing Kumbaya and keep Sabbath. Is it good to keep Sabbath? Is it good to keep Sabbath? Yes. We should keep Sabbath. God says so. The Bible says so. But if you keep Sabbath, does it mean that you love God? Not necessarily. Pharisees kept Sabbath and they killed God. Am I right? Is it good to know the Bible? Yes. We should know the Bible. But does it mean that you love Jesus? There are people who read the Bible as a duty, as a routine. Pharisees knew the scriptures, yet they killed Jesus. Is it good to eat healthy? Yes or no? 
Oh yes, we are the body of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Does it mean if you eat tofu and broccoli and green beans, does it mean that you love Jesus? No. Unless you commit yourself with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your beings, with all your time, with all your gifts, with all your power, with everything you are, everything you have, unless you fully surrender as God gave himself to you, unless you give yourself to God, you are a Pharisee. You come to church for no reason. When Jesus comes, he's going to say, go away, I don't know you. And you say, Jesus, come on. We went to church. We sang Kumbaya, we ate tofu, and we kept Sabbath, and we returned tithe, and we did Sabbath school lesson, and we sang in the choir. And Jesus said, you did, but you never loved me. You loved yourself. You worshipped yourself. Unless you love God more than anything, to the degree that you are ready to die for him, joyfully, and consider it a privilege. You say, God died for me, I'm happy to die for him. Unless you love God to that degree, you are not a Christian. So Jesus says, don't be deceived. You can deceive yourself. You don't need Satan to deceive you. You deceive yourself. You go to church. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Sooner than you think. Look around. Jesus is coming. Jesus is finally coming. We are going to see him. Coming again. Coming again. Jesus is coming again. And then, when Jesus comes, are you going to go to heaven or not? And if you don't go to heaven, why are you here? Lose your time. Stay home, watch a stupid movie, eat a non-healthy pizza. Because you lose time here. Unless you fully surrender. Elena I says surrender is not a one-time deal when you get baptized. She says surrender is a lifelong event. She says it happens every day. As Paul says, I die daily. Surrender is a daily, lifelong process. You need to love him to the degree that you die to self every day. And you surrender your life, and you surrender your life, and you surrender your car, and you surrender your job, and you surrender your family, and you surrender your health, and you surrender everything and say, all to Jesus. And you don't only sing it, you do it. Unless you trust him to the degree that you are ready to sacrifice self, you are not a Christian. Only those who love God more than themselves, only those will go to heaven. And if you don't learn to surrender today, then when? When? You remember from my sermons, when I was a kid, I was walking to school, and I would go to the market, because it was a shortcut, and there, in the market, there was a guy from Turkey, his grandson was my classmate, and the guy was called Bayram Hassan. I have pictures with him. I can show you the pictures. And he had a cart with three wheels that had three stainless steel containers and ice around. In the containers, it was ice cream. Vanilla ice cream, chocolate ice cream, and pistachio ice cream. And the guy would scream loud, Today you pay! Tomorrow is free! I believed him. I paid, I got a scoop of chocolate. I don't like vanilla. My wife likes vanilla. And the scoop of pistachio is not healthy, but it's good. Uh, so I got two scoops, I paid two bucks. And then I went next day, I said, I want my free ice cream. He said, son, today you pay. Tomorrow is free. I said, no, 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 no. I came yesterday that was today, and now I came today that is tomorrow. So give me my free ice cream. He said, no, no, no. Today is not tomorrow, today is today. And today you pay. I paid again. I came next day. I said, hey, I came tomorrow. Give me my free ice cream. He said, no, you came today again. And today you pay. I said, come on, man. I came tomorrow. He said, no, you came today. Tomorrow is free. Today you pay. I said, come on, man. When is tomorrow? And he said, tomorrow never comes. 
Why do you think that you are going to surrender tomorrow, that you are going to prepare tomorrow? Jesus says, quoting Daniel, Jesus says there will be a crisis in Matthew 4, there will be a crisis, there will be a crisis like never in the earth history. This earth has had many crises, many wars, many catastrophes. This crisis that comes is going to be bigger than anything before. It is foolish to think that you are going to prepare for the war the night before the war. It is foolish to think that you are going to prepare for the Olympics the night before the Olympics. Why do you think that you are going to prepare for the greatest crisis in history the night before? If you don't prepare today, if you don't surrender today, if you don't pray and study today, you will not prepare them. It's going to be too late. Elijah fixed the altar. Before Jesus comes, Elijah is going to come. Jesus says, watch and pray. People who prepare for the second coming are the people who are going to watch, pay attention, pray, study the word. They are going to stand on the Bible. If you don't stand on the Bible, you are going to be blown left and right by different winds and doctrines and theories. But if you pray and study the word, you are going to stand solid. I hear people, oh, pastor, I do pray. And I ask them, how long do you pray? Oh, I don't know. That means you don't pray. It's like when I say, I do fast. How long do you fast? I don't know. That means you don't fast. If you fast two minutes, you don't know. If you fast five days, you know. If you pray two minutes, you don't know. If you pray three hours, trust me, you know. People who don't put their heart, they do it as duty. They do it as routine. Fix the altar. I've seen in so many years of ministry, over 30 years, many people divorced. I always ask them, are you praying together? And they say, yeah. When? At, before we eat? I say, no, 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 no. Do you spend time Having a family altar where you pray and study together. Oh, pastor, we don't have time. And they call me, pastor, my kids left the church. Would you pray for my kids? Did you have the family altar? Oh, pastor, we don't have time. No wonder your kids are in the world. I've never seen husband and wife who pray together divorced. Only those that pray alone. I've seen them divorced. Fix the altar. Time for quality prayer. Time for quality study of the Bible. So this way, you are prepared for the crisis and you will not be deceived. Jesus says that there will be a crisis like never before. And Jesus says, take heed, pay attention. So nobody deceives you because there will be false doctrines, false theories, false this and false Christ and false prophets and false. And then Jesus says, there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be catastrophes, earthquakes, pandemics, economical collapse, uh, uh, political turmoil, uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, he didn't say that. War in Israel, uh, uh, economical tragedies. Uh, there will be this and that. And then Jesus says, that's not the end. Because people say, oh, this is the end. War in Israel. That's not the end. The gospel is going to be preached to all the world. That's when the end comes. I've never seen the Bible, the book, jumping up and down and preaching. Have you seen a Bible preaching? Have you seen a Bible jumping and moving and opening the, and speaking? The Bible says that the gospel is going to be preached to the whole world and then Jesus will come. Who is supposed to preach the gospel? Jesus told you. He says, go, start from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the 
end of the world. Jesus commanded you to preach the gospel. And you say, how do I prepare? Well, very simple. Jesus in Matthew 24 and 25 told them there will be this and that and that. And then Ellen White says that after Jesus the signs of the end, Jesus told them how to prepare. And Jesus told them how to prepare, giving them five parables. How many? What are the five parables? The fig tree. What is the fig tree supposed to do? To produce fruit. If the tree doesn't produce fruits, it's going to be chopped off. It's going to die. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. It's not by their sermons. It's not by their theoretical knowledge. Because we know a lot of theology. Jesus told them clearly, go in the world and preach the gospel. The fruit that doesn't make, the tree that doesn't make fruits will be cut off. You don't know them by their theory. They have a lot of theology in their mind. You know them by their fruits. It's easy for us to know the theory, but it's difficult to produce the fruits because it's the fruit of the Spirit. And you cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit unless you have the Spirit because it's not your fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. You understand? It's like if you are an apple tree, you cannot make bananas, you make apples. <coughs> and you can try really hard to make bananas, you still make apples. To make the fruit of the Spirit, you need to have the Spirit, and the Spirit in you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. And then Jesus talks about not only the fig tree, the second parable, Jesus talks about the unfaithful servant. Jesus says, the master talked to the servant and said, I'm going to a faraway country, I will be back. Until I come, feed my people. And the Bible says that the servant, after a while, stopped feeding the others and said, oh, the master is delayed, the master is not coming. And instead of feeding the others, he started to beat the others. And he says, when the master comes, he's going to destroy that servant. Because people, there are only two categories in the church. People who feed the others and people who beat the others. Usually those who work don't have time to beat the others. And those who do nothing, what do they do? They criticize the others. Spiritually sick people. Who gave you the right to talk about the others. Jesus is coming soon. Take care of yourself. Make sure that you are okay. Because with the measure you judge, with that measure, you will be judged. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Because God is the judge, and he doesn't need your help. He does perfect justice. God doesn't need you to be the judge for him. But I see people sometimes, I'm not going to tell you, in many countries, in many places, they just love gossiping. It's like honey. It's like, it's, they live with it. They love it to talk about others. Spiritually sick people, search your own heart. Make sure that you are okay. Because Jesus is coming. And you want to be ready. But the servant that stops serving starts abusing the others, criticizing the others, beating the others, doing nothing. God called the servant to serve. Do your job. Serve. The third parable, first one was the fig tree, second one was the unfaithful servant. Third one, the ten virgins. What you are supposed to have? What is the oil? Okay. 
Why? Why oil? What was the reason to have oil just because, oh, I would like to have some oil. What was the reason, the purpose to have oil, to have the Holy Spirit? So their lambs would, would burn. There would be a light because Jesus says, you are the light of the and he says, don't hide your light. Let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Okay? You are supposed to light. You are supposed to be a light. You are the light of the world. The virgin says in parables, in, in, in the book called Christ Object Lesson, page 411, it says, the virgins are supposed to light the way from the entrance in the city to every intersection to the wedding hall. So nobody who wants to go to the wedding would get lost in darkness. They are supposed to light the way so people can clearly see how to go to the wedding. God called you to light the way so nobody around you will be lost. God says, son of man, I put you as the watchman over the others. If you tell them and they don't listen, their blood is going to be required from their hands. But if you don't tell them, their blood is going to be required from your hands. And the Lord says, God makes us responsible for our families, for our friends, for our neighbors, for our co-workers. How many of you pray for the neighbors? We don't even sometimes know the name of the neighbors. But God says, if you love me, you love your neighbor. If you say that you love me and you don't love your neighbor, you are a liar, says in what book? First John chapter 4. If you say that you love God and you don't love your neighbor, you are a liar. It's easy to say you love God, but prove it. Love your neighbor. You follow me? The virgins are supposed to be a light for the neighbors. Ellen White says, not everybody can go to a foreign country as a missionary, but everybody is called to be a missionary in his neighborhood. She says, God is going to make us responsible for those precious people. God loves them. Jesus died for them. They are God's children. God loves them as much as he loves you. He cares for his children. If you don't love them, you are not a Christian. How do you prepare for the second coming? Be a light. Next parable. What is the next one? The talents. God gave one one talent, gave one two talents, gave one five talents. What are you supposed to do with the gifts, the talents that God has given you? What are you supposed to do? Use them. Don't bury them. Use them for God. And if you do that, God is going to bless them and multiply them. If not, you are going to lose them. And the last parable, it says there that God divided. When Jesus comes, he's going to divide people in two groups. The sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand. And he's going to say to the goats, Oh, you evil people, worshippers, you didn't come to church. Is he going to say that? No. He says, I was in prison. Well, Jesus never, Jesus never went to prison. Only evil people, criminals go to prison. And Jesus says, I was naked. Have you seen Jesus naked? I was thirsty. I was hungry. I was homeless. I was, and, and they say, Jesus, we have never seen you in prison. And Jesus says, every time you did it for them, you did it to me. Jesus identifies himself with those people. That means that Jesus cares for those people. Jesus loves those people. He died for them. They are his precious children. And if you don't love them, you may go to church and sing Kumbaya. You don't love Jesus. 
So how do you prepare for the second coming? Do you understand? The parables tell you how to prepare. The Spirit of Prophecy says clearly, all those who serve God will be those that are ready. And then she says, the more we serve others, the more we become like Jesus who came to serve. The more we serve others, the stronger we become. The more we grow more and more to be like Jesus. Because heaven is based on service. How many people do you serve? I go to church to get a blessing. You'll never get a blessing. You need to go to church to be a blessing. And then you get a blessing. Because the only blessing is when you bless others. It's a greater blessing to give than to receive. Ellen White says six testimonies. Testimony volume six. She says, nobody prays right seeking a blessing for self. God will give you blessings only to the degree that you bless others. Listen, folks. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in study. Spend time reaching your neighbors. That's how you prepare for the final crisis. Do that today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Do that tomorrow. Do that Saturday. Do that Sunday. Do that Monday, Tuesday, every day. And when the crisis comes, you are ready. Well, pastor, when I'm going to see the final crisis, then I prepare. Look around. The final crisis have been around for a while. You understand? The Bible says that the final crisis will be like the pregnancy contractions, the pregnancy pains. You remember? I've never been pregnant, but my wife has been pregnant. And I remember when she gave birth to our first son, we were in Bucharest. And my wife says, oops, I felt something moving. I said, you ate too much green beans. She says, no, 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 no. There was something that got like that in my, in my tummy. Four hours later, she says, oops, again. Four hours later, oops, again. And then three hours later, she says, oh, and now it's stronger. And then two hours later, and then one hour, and then half an hour, and then 15 minutes. And it came more fragrant. It intensified in frequency, and it came longer. First pain was just one second. Second pain was five seconds. Third pain was one minute. Fourth pain was ten minutes. It intensified in length. First pain was just a little. Second pain bigger. The last pain was extremely painful. Ah! It intensifies in intensity, in frequency, in length, in intensity. The same Jesus says with the final crisis. One earthquake every 50 years, and then one earthquake every 10 years, and then one earthquake every year, and then one earthquake every day, and then 300 a day, and then 300 a minute, and then it's going to intensify more worse and more. And the Lenoy says the final events, when they start, they are going to be in rapid succession. It's going to become crazy, worse and economic crisis, and a political crisis, and catastrophes, and pandemics, and people say, hopefully it's going to get better. It's not going to get better. The Bible says it's going to get worse. Worse. More and more and more and more, to the degree that people are going to lose their mind. And if you don't have a strong relationship with Jesus, if you don't know him, if you don't trust him in small crises, how are you going to trust him in the biggest crisis? If you don't learn to walk with him today, how are you going to walk with him then? Preparation starts today. The Bible says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Ellen White says, every time the Holy Spirit talks to you and you procrastinate, she says, you harden your heart and become insensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, don't procrastinate. God is talking to you. 
God loves you and he wants you to prepare because he wants you to be saved. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today if you hear his voice. Choose you today. It never says tomorrow. Why pray and study? Because our minds are created in a way that whatever you spend time with, whatever you dwell upon, whatever you focus on, whatever you read or watch and talk and think, that's who you become. The more you spend time with something, the more you become that way. If you spend time with politics, you are going to be on fire for politics. If you spend time with music or sports, you are going to be more and more into sports. But if you spend time with Jesus, you are going to change, the Bible says, from glory to glory by beholding. The more your mind dwells on him, the more you become like him. Spiritual prophet says, at the foot of the cross, as you reflect on his love and his sacrifice, you are transformed more and more into his image. You understand him more. You love him more. You trust him more. You become more like him. Spend time in prayer. Today. Spend time in study of the word. Today. Go to your neighbor. Today. Say, neighbor. I made bread today. I'm going to give you half of the bread. And I want to pray for you. Let me pray for you. Reach your neighbor because God is going to make you responsible because God loves these people. Do you understand how you prepare? Let me finish with, with a story that you probably know. When we moved to Maryland, I want you to plant a garden. I love gardening. When I go in the garden, you think I'm crazy. I speak to my tomatoes. They never speak back to me, but that's okay. I speak to my tomatoes. But when we moved to Maryland, we were on the mountain. It was solid rock. There was no way to plant a garden in the stone. It was not little stones. It was solid rock block. So what to do? I went to a Mennonite farm and brought 11 trailers of manure and put like 12 inches, that's around 30, 25, 30 centimeters of compost manure. And then I planted my garden in manure. But it was so rich that my tomatoes grew big, 10 feet tall tomatoes with 50, 60 tomatoes per plant, each plant. And two pounds, big tomatoes, two pounds, one tomato, watermelon, one meter, over one meter watermelons, big. I have pictures. People say I am exaggerating. No, I have pictures. I have pictures with the measure and the scale. Eggplants, four pounds an eggplant. Like Canaan, big. In the same time, my neighbor, his wife tried to plant a garden. She never managed because it was rock. So I moved there. I went in the garden. I kneeled down and I prayed, Lord, if you bless my garden, I'm not going to ask you for a blessing for myself. I'm going to use 50% of the garden as mission. I'm going to go from neighbor to neighbor, give them tomatoes, give them cucumbers, give them peppers, give them okra, give them watermelons, give them cantaloupes, and give them books and pray for them. And God bless my garden. So I went to the next neighbor. Knocked in the door. Man. A guy with a long beard. Came at the door with a shotgun. He came with a gun. Who are you and what do you want? I said. I'm the next door neighbor. I just moved here. What do you want? I came to give you tomatoes. Oh, you are a good guy. <sighs> yes. I want to pray for you. I don't uh, go to church. I said, did I ask you to go to church? I just want to pray for you. Uh, I never pray. Did I ask you to pray? 
Tell me what to pray for. Well, my wife and I don't have children. We have been trying for many years. I said, call your wife. She, he called her. I put my hands around her shoulder. I said, Lord Jesus, they are your precious children that Jesus died for. Would you please give them a baby? So when they know how much they love their baby, they would understand how much you love them because they are your babies. And through the babies, they are going to understand your love for them. Thank you, Jesus. By the way, next year, they had a baby. Next day, I went across the street on the right side. I knock in the door. A guy comes out. He says, I know who you are. You came to give me tomatoes and to pray for me. <laughs> I said, yes. He says, I know everything. I mow the grass for every neighbor. And they tell me everything. And I like to ask questions because I like to know everything. And that guy talked for 40 minutes continually without breathing. Like, I mean, he talked even more than I talk. That guy talked. I was praying in my mind, Lord Jesus, please help him stop. I need to go home. <laughs> and then he said, okay, I know you want to go. Pray for me. Finally. So I said, what do you want me to pray for? Well, my wife has three terminal cancers. Cancer in her lungs, cancer in her breast, cancer in her... I said, okay. So I prayed for them. By the way, she's still alive. And then next day, I went to the other neighbor across the street in the left side. And he said, well, pastor, I lost my wife to cancer. I lost my daughter to cancer. And my son had a car accident. He is paralyzed. I prayed for him. I said, Lord, give him comfort and faith and peace. And the next day, I went to the neighbor next to me. I knocked in the door. He says, who are you? What do you want? I said, I'm the next neighbor. I want to give you tomatoes. He says, you have an accent. I said, yes. I'm originally from Romania. And he started to curse bad words. I cannot even tell you the first letter of the word. He said, you tam, 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 immigrants, we hate you. You better die. Go back to your country. We hate you. And he was cursing and cursing and oh. He says, get away from my door. Don't ever come back. I'm going to have the police arrest you. We hate you. Go away from our country. Whoa. I went back home. I told my wife, we live next to Satan. <laughs> and she said, well, God put you here to save them. I said, you cannot save Satan. <laughs> she says, God put you here for them. God loves them too. And I said, God loves them and that's enough. I don't have to love them. <laughs> and my wife says, well, maybe God put them here for you because you need to repent. Because the Bible doesn't say love those who love you. The Bible says love those who... And she says, you will not be ready for second coming unless you love them. Because if you don't love your enemies, you are not like Jesus. I said, honey, stop preaching to me. I am the pastor. <laughs> I said, if you want, you love them. She said, okay, but you need to get out of ministry. Uh, I didn't like my wife anymore. <laughs> and then my wife says, how can you go to church and keep Sabbath and sing Kumbaya and preach if you are unable to love your neighbor and pray for your neighbor, why do you even go to church? Why do you pray? Why do you study the Bible? And I put my head down. I knew that she was right. And she said to me, pray for them. I said, okay, Lord Jesus, please change these evil people so they leave me alone. And my wife says, that's not the way you pray. You just pray for you. You need to pray for them. I said, okay, Lord Jesus, save them. She says, that's not the way you pray for them. I said, what do you want me to say? And she says, if you want to be like Jesus, you need to say, Jesus, take my life and save them. Because Jesus was willing to give his life to save them. If you want to be like Jesus, you need to be willing to sacrifice yourself to save others. I said, honey, I cannot pray that prayer. What if God would answer it? 
Yeah. Why would I say, take my life? What if you would answer it, you know? And she says, then you don't love Jesus? But I do love Jesus. No, because you don't love your neighbor the way Jesus loves your neighbor. And if you don't love your neighbor, you don't love Jesus. You are not a pastor. You are not a Christian. Go home. I said, I am home. And then I thought about what my wife said. And I went in my bedroom. And I prayed the most difficult prayer of my life. I prayed it with fear. I was afraid that God would answer it. I said, Lord, I hope you don't answer it. (laughs) But I'm going to say it. I'm willing to sacrifice myself if that would take to save my neighbor. And when I prayed that prayer, I finally had peace in my heart. Five days later, I heard noise in my backyard. I went out to see what's happening. The neighbor's dogs crossed the property and they were playing with my dogs. Well, that neighbor, six months, gave us terrible time. He called the police, he called the human society, he called every day he did something against us. Now his dogs were on my property. So I went there and I played with them and I gave them food. And, and then I looked to the right, to the left, and see my neighbor watching. Open mouth. So I said to the dogs, let's puppy, let's go home, let's go home. I took the dogs to him. And I said, come over. He says, no. He said, come over. Why? Did my dogs do any damage and you want me to pay? I said, no. Did my dogs poop and you want me to clean? He said, no. Why should I come? Come over. No. Come a little, one minute. No. Come a little, I want to show you something. He said, okay. And he followed me, looking left and right, skeptical, suspicious. I took him to the garden. I showed him the garden. He said, whoa, big tomatoes. I said, yep. I gave him a basket. I said, help yourself. He took two tomatoes and he left. I said, no, 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 come back. He says, you want me to pay? No. And I put tomatoes and I put cucumbers and I put peppers and I put eggplants and I gave him a watermelon and I gave him a cantaloupe and I gave him, you know, until I filled the basket. He could not even carry it. He, it was, he says, oh, you gave me so much. He says, can I call my wife? She tried to plant a garden and she never managed. I want to show her the garden. Can I call her? I said, ah, you ask me if you can call your wife. It's your wife. <laughs> Why do you ask me? You know? He put the basket down. He says, honey, come over. She says, where? To the neighbor. She says, what neighbor? He says, you know. (laughs) He didn't say the immigrants. He said, you know. And she says, the immigrants? He said, yes. She says, is it safe? Is it safe? He says, yes. She says, should I take our son? They have a tall son that is in the military academy. Should I take our son for protection? He said, no need. She came over. I took her to the garden. I showed her the garden. She says, whoa, big garden. What have you done? I said, I prayed over it. I said, help yourself. And I gave her a basket and filled the basket. And she put the basket down and she broke. She started to cry. She was sobbing. And she said, we hate you and we curse you and you give us tomatoes. I said, no, you don't hate me. You just don't know me. But I want us to be good neighbors. I want us to have a good relationship. So I am praying for you. She said, you pray for us, we curse you. I said, well, I am praying for you. And she started, and she was crying and crying. And she said, I've been sick all my life. 
I cannot sleep. I take pills and I cannot sleep. And then I get angry and argue with my husband and argue with the neighbors. And we have no peace and no joy because I am sick. I said, come here. I put my hands around them. I said, Lord Jesus, these are your children that you died for. Please help her sleep tonight like a baby. Give her sleep so she knows that you love her. And she shook her head and she said, you are such a patient person. I said, you better talk to my wife. <laughs> and then she said, God put you here for us. God put you there because he loves your neighbor. Do you love your neighbor? Do you know them? Do you give them tomatoes or whatever, cookies or whatever, and say, let me pray for you? Do you? Because that's how you prepare. Because Jesus commanded you. He didn't give you a suggestion. Maybe if you have time, go in the world. It was a command. Start from where you live and go in the next neighbor and next neighbor and next town and next town to the end of the world. And if you do that, he promised, I will be with you. It's a command. Are you obedient to Jesus' command? Because if you love God, you love people. If you don't love people, stop coming to church. You don't love God. Did you hear me? Because you are quiet. Jesus told them how to prepare. Number one, prayer and study. Pray, study the word, reach the neighbor. Watch, because Jesus is coming. He is on the way. He is at the door. Jesus is coming sooner than you think. It's going to be a surprise. Elena White says that many of our people will be surprised. It's going to be sooner than you think. When the events start, they are going to go in such fast, uh, uh, how you say, uh, pace that you'll not be able to prepare. You need to prepare today. How many of you want to prepare today? God is calling you to make a decision today. God is calling you to make a decision to start from now on, today, tomorrow, every day. Make him a priority. Start the day with prayer and study. And not anemic duty prayer. Ta -ta 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 -ta, amen. But serious prayer. Not anemic study. Oh, I read a chapter, I did my duty. But dig deep into the treasure of the world. The Bible says, what does it say about the world? It says that we are sanctified by the truth, and thy truth is the, thy word is the truth. How do you get sanctified? Through prayer and study of the word. Because the more time you spend with Jesus, the more you are transformed. Quality time in prayer and study of the word. Quality time fixing the worship altar. Your personal worship time and your family worship time. And then praying for the neighbors and reaching the neighbors. Use every opportunity. For instance, pray in the morning and say, Lord, here I am. Send me. I make myself available. Use me. The spirit of prophecy in ministry of healing says, Jesus didn't make plans for himself. Not because he didn't have a brain. But the, the spirit of prophecy says that God gave him the plans for every day. And then she says, so should we give up our plans and seek God's plan. And follow God's plan every day and trust him that he will take care of you. Because he promised that if you put him first, he will take care of the other things. He promised. The other things are going to burn. You are not going to take them to heaven. I left home to go to a board meeting. 
I was driving and I prayed, Lord, I make myself available today. If there is somebody who needs help, open my eyes to see people and to follow your plan. Here I am. I want to follow your plan. Show me your plan. When I finish praying, my telephone starts ringing. I answer, it was my wife. She says, honey, Gucci is vomiting blood. Gucci is my dog, my puppy. I call my elder, I said, have the board meeting without me, I have an emergency. I turned the car around, went home, took my dog, went to the vet. And the vet said, hey, he ate a bone and the bone got stuck in the neck. The vet took the bone out and that's it. But then the vet says, Mr. Goya, you are in a suit. I said, yeah, it's not against the law to be in a suit. He says, but yeah, but it's Thursday night. Why are you in a suit Thursday night? I said, because I go to work. He says, Thursday night at 6 p.m. you go to work? What do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. He says, you never told us. I said, should I come and say, hello, I am a pastor. I said, you never asked. He said, well, I am glad you came. Because right before you came, we talked. What happened to people and to animals when they die? Do they go to hell or they go to heaven? So I gave him a Bible study on the state of the dead. I said, if they don't go to hell, they don't go to heaven. They go in the ground and rest. He says, no, 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 no. Our pastor told us that they go to heaven. I said, hello. Why would they go to heaven when the Bible says that they rest in the ground? And the Bible talks about resurrection. When the second coming comes, if they are in heaven, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to put you a second in the ground to resurrect you. Why would God take them from heaven, put them in the ground to resurrect them, to take them to heaven if they are already in heaven? He says, oh. I said, don't listen to anybody. Listen to the Bible. He says, well, I'm glad you came. Now it's clear. But still we don't understand how it's going to be the resurrection and the second coming. And he says, come tomorrow again. We check the dog to make sure that he heals. And you are going to explain about the second coming. So I went tomorrow again. And I gave them another study on the second coming. And he says, can you come again? Because you don't understand the millennium. So I went next day again and I gave a Bible study on millennium. And he said, can you come again? So we understand the, t the Ten Commandments. So I went again. And then I went every day. When we had evangelism, six from the doctor's office came to evangelism. Because nothing happens by chance. But all things work together. God allowed my dog to be sick because there were precious people that had questions. And God wanted me to go and answer those questions. But what if I would have said, Lord, I need to be at the board meeting. Jesus made no plans for himself. But he received the plans from the Father. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you. If you really want to serve God, make yourself available every day and say, Lord Jesus, Use me today. That's what you sing when you say, and he walks with me and he talks with me. What does it mean to walk with God and talk with God? Unless you are continually connected, continually available, ready to serve. When God says serve, you serve. When God says go, you go. And you trust in him. If you don't learn to do that today, when are you going to do it? God is calling you today to make a decision. Jesus is coming soon. He wants you to be ready. Start the day with study and prayer. Quality prayer, quality study of the Bible. And then use every opportunity God gives you to reach people who don't know Jesus, to help people in need, to be a light, to be a blessing, to be salt. Amen?